Okay. Um, I found a map, so if you want to go to the screen here. Okay, this is this area here would be Manchuria. And you can see Russia to the north, and then, you know, it, it uh, uh, is adjacent to Korea, too, which will become important later. This kind of section here, this northern, northeastern section is Manchuria, which is really uh, economically really critical to uh, um, uh, China's economy. And this is why, you know, this is the area where the U.S. wants to get uh, uh, a great deal of... Uh, Co you know, commercial interest. So um, Manchuria in particular is the site where the Americans want to, to put in this railway uh, consortium. The goal there, the United States proposes, is that all railroads in Manchuria be either neutralized or internationalized. It basically means the same thing. What do you think that means? Neutralized or internationalized? It means everyone can inv hmm? Trade well in the real world. That would be we would I would like, but they can't make that ultimatum because they don't have the the power to do it yet. So what it means initially is the neutralization or internationalization means that everybody should have access to building these railways in Manchuria. Right? Everybody should be allowed to have a, a, a cut of it. To use kind of a more contemporary example, not particularly appropriate but somewhat useful, um, would be the contracts to rebuild Iraq. Right? I mean the State Department remember said, or it was actually the Pentagon, it said, no one is even allowed to bid on these unless you were with us, unless you supported the war. Effectively cutting out companies like Schlumberger from France, right? So this would be something that would not be an internationalization or a neutralization project. It ticked off a lot of Americans, people like Jim Baker as well, but the point here is that, that, that internationalization or neutralization would say everybody's allowed to have access to the rebuilding contracts here, right, the reconstruction contracts. As I said, not entirely appropriate, but somewhat illustrative of it. So what the Americans want is a neutralization or an internationalization arrangement. Essentially what they want, to be quite simple, is the open door. Right? They want a large international loan in China to buy the railway lines. All right? The Americans will certainly put up a lot of capital, but they want to internationalize it both to provide more capital and also to give uh, more kind of authority to the open door. However, the Japanese and the Russians who are neutralization or this internationalization scheme, why? If you're Japan or Russia, why would you turn this down? You, why would you why would you do it would be the better question because you're already there you already have access to Manchuria you have a foothold in that region why let the Americans in one Japanese official said Philander Knox who was talking about the neutralization scheme Philander Knox was quote asking us to internationalize what is our property acquired by us already at the cost of much treasure and many lives as far as the Japanese are concerned, they fought the Sino-Japanese War, they fought the Russo-Japanese War. Why would they let the Americans in? Did the Americans fight wars against, against China and Russia? No, what did the Americans do? They sent a few Marines in to try to crush the Boxer Rebellion. Didn't do any good, right? So Knox and, and, and Taft had blundered with this Manchurian railway scheme. So they next decided to look for American entry into another consortium with the British, the French, and the Germans, which was building a railway to link Beijing and Canton, Guangdong. I don't have the map, I'm not gonna go back to it. So the United States in 1910 was admitted into that consortium, and then Japan and Russia went in too. This isn't the big Manchuria one, however, all right, this is globalization, right? Getting access to foreign markets, getting access to foreign investment. And China's huge. This is the China market. The China market was always more of a dream than a reality, more rhetoric than concrete material stuff. Okay, it was always something they looked at potentially as being something really wonderful and great, never really materialized. And in May of 1911, a full-scale revolution against the Manchus began and the railway project again had to be put on hold because there's a civil war. Revolution actually taking place in 1913 with the revolution still raging against the Manchus. Woodrow Wilson is president now with William Jennings Bryan and they cancel America's role in the consortium altogether and Wilson has a different vision. All right. In China, the revolution has succeeded, and the Manchus have been overthrown, and China becomes a republic led eventually by Sun Yat-sen. Now, 
uh, in, uh, eventually by Sun Yat-sen. The first head of this new Japanese, uh, I'm sorry, Chinese Republic was a reformist named Wan shir -Ki. Wilson believed that he could basically work with Ron shir -Ki, who was a, a, a kind of a liberal reformist, kind of like a Carranza would have been in Mexico, to use that example, or kind of like Kerensky in, in uh, Russia when we get to that. Wilson believes he can work with Wan shir -Ki, this reformer, and get him to recognize the open door Right? Now, the open door creates kind of unilateral opportunities that a consortium doesn't. So Wilson is the first, I believe, to recognize this new independent Chinese republic. All right? And then asks them to, uh, to uh, recognize the open door. However, what do you think Japan's position on all this is going to be? Japan is still going to have principal interest in China. Even though China has become independent, has become a republic, it, you know, uh, it still does not have the power to remove Japanese geopolitical influence from that region. So uh, the Japanese still reject any American attempts to get a foothold there. And in fact, in January of 1915, while World War I was being fought, Japan declared war on Germany in 1914, I believe. And actually, because Germany had lands and had territories, remember, uh, Kiachau, Shingdao, and also an area called Zhuangzhou. And so Japan declares war on Germany to take these German leaseholds back. In January of 1915, Tokyo issued something called the 21 demands right here which I always do with my finger you can't see that the 21 demands okay and the 21 demands basically said this is Japan's way of saying we want a virtual protectorate over China we have the most interest in China we're closest we have a cultural and a political and an economic stake there uh, and so uh, uh, we want control of China and China of course protests it but, you know, what can anybody do to stop Japan from, from receiving that? So uh, 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 the Japanese, when they issue the 21 demands, basically get their way. They, they more or less get control of China. Woodrow Wilson's hands are busy in Mexico dealing with the outbreak of, of World War I, of the Great War. So he really can't do anything. And all he can really do is continue to rhetorically say, we want the, the open door recognized and we want China to have territorial and political integrity, meaning we don't want anybody to come in and take over China. So. Um, Japan, uh, 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 really, he doesn't have anybody stopping them. Uh, uh, Japan still has this interest there. And in November of 1917, the Japanese Foreign Minister, Viscount Ishii, and the American Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, got together and actually kind of uh, uh, made official, legitimated this uh, policy in East Asia. In November of 1917, um, Lansing and Ishii signed an agreement which recognized Japan's special relationship in China. Right? Um, it said that the, the United States recognized that Japan had special interest in China and it said that Japan should respect the open door. As a result of the Lansing Ishii agreements, Japan thought, believed that its political control of China had been recognized. The U.S. did not believe that it had gone that far. Uh, and Japan believed that its hands were now free to do whatever it wanted in China. The U.S. again said no, but the reality of it was that Japan could do that. All right. So the Lansing Ishii Agreement basically then uh, uh, legitimates or, or recognizes that Japan has this pr primary preponderant role to play throughout all of Asia. This is going to be increasingly important in the 30s as the U.S. and Japan move toward war. All right. So then, uh, by the time we get to the eve of World War I, this is where we stopped in both Latin America and now in Asia with the Mexican Revolution and now with the, the uh, Chinese Revolution and the, and the uh, Lansing Ishii Agreement. The United States has clearly embarked on this massive globalizing mission, uh, as sometimes coercively, as in the Dominican Republic or Haiti and Nicaragua, sometimes by trying to assert the open door, as with this banking consortium. And in fact, uh, Roosevelt tried to uh, kind of revive the whole consortium issue after, even after the Lansing Ishii Agreement uh, was uh, um, 
was uh, signed. I mean, in a sense, Roosevelt undermines Chinese sovereignty by continuing to try to come up with some kind of a deal with the Japanese. So it's, it's, it's really kind of covert, it's furtive, it, it certainly doesn't work for the best interests of those countries involved. All right? And in the long term, it's going to have grave consequences. I mean, you know, you can say, well, so what? Who cares about China and Japan? But, you know, December 7, 1941 is obviously a major event. And it's the direct result of this, not to give blame to, you know, anything or, or to, to, to uh, uh, go soft on the Japanese militarists. But the point is there's a long historical legacy leading to this. So by 1917, then... Um, Clearly, the Americans are, are on this uh, uh, globalizing mission, well into this globalizing mission, and uh, are about to uh, really make a huge stride with um, World War One. But have any questions on this stuff? This kind of moving out in Latin America and Asia, globalization. Yeah. So the whole purpose. You want to push on the thing so so you be preserved forever. I think on the and the green light will go on. Now you put the bottom of it. Here. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Uh, so the whole purpose of the uh, Ishii Lansing agreement was just to get Japan to say we respect your open door policy. That's it, it. Yeah, that's kind of the way it turned out. Lansing Ishii didn't do anything that wasn't obvious to the world already. I mean, the U.S. recognizes Japan's special interests. Well, Japan had them. You know, 1894, 1905, two wars gave them that. So the special interests were already there, and then. Uh, by Japan saying we respect the open door and the territorial integrity, I mean that's you know that's rhetorical. But at the same time, in, in the world of you know kind of international relations, you know having this recognition is important to give it this kind of credibility. But I mean in the real term, no, it didn't change much. You know that's why December seventh, nineteen forty one occurs ultimately. All right. Any other questions on this stuff? All right. In both cases then, you know, I ended kind of around 1917, and that's because something far more important is occurring in 1917, and that would be, of course, World War I, the U.S. entry into World War I. World War I would actually become prior to that. So I want to give a little bit of a background to it. I'll try to do this really quickly and kind of uh, throw a couple maps up there, uh, that kind of thing, but try to be quick about it. Um, there we go. You don't have to go to that yet, or you can. Um, so we can get that to stay there. All right. Um, <clears throat> in Europe, in the early 1900s, there's a, a, a difference in the way that the Europeans practice international relations and the way that the Americans are trying to do it. The United States is trying to create this new open-door liberal world. All right, based on dollars, not bullets, as William Howard Taft put it. The Europeans are still doing what we would call the old diplomacy. The Europeans have traditional empires. They go into other lands and take over territories. And they send in their occupying troops, or they send in, uh, uh, and they send in their administrators, and actually take control over other countries, you know, the, uh, the British in India or the... Uh, the Belgians in the Congo, or uh, you know, the French in Vietnam, a zillion examples of it. This is also part of a balance of power. In Europe, you want all the major powers to balance themselves out, and one way you do this is by acquiring territories and by having you know strong militaries in your home continents. You don't want anybody to gain too much power because that'll throw everything out of balance, right? So you have these major countries in Europe, especially the British, the Germans, and the French. The Russians are kind of posers at this time because they're falling apart, right? But in Europe, this is the way you do things. You have this kind of concert of Europe, to use an old phrase from the 19th century, in which uh, 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 the smaller nations have to kind of link up to the bigger countries, and the great powers decide among themselves what to do, and they maintain a balance that way. They assume the right to tell smaller countries or colonies what to do. They don't believe in national self-determination because that could disrupt the balance of power. They have colonies. They have empires. Two big ones, which you really can't. Well, yeah, you can't sell if you want to go to the map for a minute here. The, the two big empires in this area will be the Ottoman Empire and the Austria-Hungary or Habsburg Empire. All right, and those are going to be important as the war uh, uh, comes, and um, as they break up, then there's going to be this flurry, this dash. I mean, a lot of the roots of the modern crisis in the Middle East can be traced to the breakup of the Ottoman Empire because all that territory is now open, and there's a mad rush to go in and, and take it over, and you start to see the British and the French, and you know later on the Americans uh, uh, come with that. 
All right, but this is all part of the balance of power. <clears throat> so uh, the Americans don't believe in this balance of power arrangement. They want an open door. In the U.S., a new order had emerged based on these huge corporations, industrialization, huge business interests with vast amounts of capital and international networks of trade and investment and supply and distribution. So corporate capitalism in the United States is a direct uh, a conflict, is in direct conflict with the old diplomacy of Europe which is based on this kind of concert, this arrangement, this balance there. Corporate capitalism needs raw materials, it needs consumers, but they are not plentiful enough at home. And the Americans find that out in the 1890s, right? But the other countries, the Europeans are finding that out as well too because they're industrializing. The Germans and the French and the, and the British all have major industrial uh, uh, economies as well. So the U.S. is the strongest economic power but certainly not the only one. And so this is going to uh, 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 lead to uh, uh, a conflict. Okay, You can kind of see where this is headed. And the, the best known theorist of modern industrial imperial development at the time was a Russian named Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Just as the United States goes after Guam and Hawaii and Puerto Rico and the Philippines and Cuba, uh, the Europeans are looking for new area too. And the British, the French, and the Germans had the most extensive reaches, all right? Now, as these countries industrialize, they find themselves having the same problem the Americans had in the 1890s. Overproduction, surplus capital, deflation, the need for markets. So what do you do, all right? Well, Lenin was, was analyzing this. He was in a, a, a exile in Zurich, in Switzerland. He'd been kicked out of Russia because he's was trying to upset the government. So, <clears throat> so Lenin wrote a little pamphlet called um, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Really one of the most influential, arguably the most influential uh, uh, political work of the, the 20th century, certainly way up there. Lenin looked around at the industrialized, at the developed world, and he said, in these countries, industrial and financial forces are controlling the foreign economic policies. Foreign economic policies are being based upon the needs of the ruling class, the financial industrial elites. All right? Now, initially, these people were kind of satiated by gaining colonies, especially in Europe, because Europe had this kind of old colonial relationship, right? They didn't do the open door thing. So Europe had acquired colonies, and they'd gone into that's what, you know China, you know, who talked to Hong Kong and Macau and Kia Chow and everything like that. Now, however, once that rush had ended, once that colony colonial frenzy had kind of dried up, then real problems set in. If all the colonies in the world, the, the so-called third world, the underdeveloped, if that's all sucked up, if everybody gets a piece of that, what happens? Can you quit growing? No. You need more, right? You have to continue to grow. So then what, what becomes the consequence? These major powers, once the colonial world is taken up, what are they going to do? What does Lenin say? What does he predict? They come into conflict with each other, right? So he's talking about this period where these major powers, these inter-imperialist rivalries will lead to war. These major powers will clash in order to get more markets and stave off economic problems at home. Think of the 1890s in the United States. This is what Lenin is talking about, all right? The, the Sino-Japanese War and the dash to carve up China in 1894, uh, you know, is a good example of that. The open door notes is a good example of that. Um, by the late 1800s, as I said, I think last week, Europe's economic power was on the wane. Um, Britain's industrial production uh, uh, increased in the late 19th century, but only by 2%, whereas American industrial production from 1885 to the eve of World War I increased 5.2%. So American industrial production occurred at a rate two and a half times higher than Britain's, and Germany's was 4.5%, which was over twice as much as Britain's. All right? So U.S. and Germany were the major industrial emerging powers. They had more industrial equipment than Britain. Okay, uh, Britain, for instance, was behind the U.S. and Germany in the development of the automobile. Okay, 
Britain had made, however, immense investments in foreign countries, and those were paying off. However, with the coming of war, one can see that this could become a really dicey problem. And this emphasis on foreign investment means you have to continue to find more foreign investment, and this is going to lead to conflict. Britain was, uh, uh, you know, the, the sun never sets on the British Empire. It had a vast empire to begin with, and it wanted to gain more territory. It comes into conflict uh, with France, in, in fact, in, in the Nile Valley going into Sudan, which is an area that doesn't have a whole lot of resources. You're familiar with it today. It's a place of great suffering, in fact. Uh, the British went to a place called Fashoda, uh, where the British and French in, in Sudan almost came to, to blows. They almost went to war. Now, I mean, you know, this isn't terribly important, but I think it's a good illustration because Fashoda is, is really a fairly desolate area. It, it has some, you know, kind of some strategic, you know, uses, but for the most part, um, Britain and France almost went to war over Fashoda. Think of that. I mean, that's, that's not worth going to war over. That's, that's the kind of point of this. Uh, things in South Africa uh, uh, become even more, you know, kind of contentious. Um, in South Africa, there, there are two areas called the Transvaal and Orange Free State, and gold had been discovered in the Transvaal. And so Dutch settlers called Boers had gone in there. Um, the Boers are afraid that the British will take that region and incorporate it into the British Empire. And in fact, Cecil Rhodes, you've heard of Rhodes Scholarship, Cecil Rhodes was a British investor and adventurer. Cecil Rhodes actually uh, uh, did send an expedition into the Transvaal looking for gold. Uh, the, um, the Boers attacked the British expedition and this leads to the Boer War, where the British go into South Africa and uh, 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 after a great and bloody battle, wipe out the Boers. They wipe out these Dutch settlers and incorporate South Africa into the British Empire. The Boer War unleashed a fury against Britain throughout Europe. I mean, all of Europe was, was frightened by the British because this is the way Britain, Britain's industrial output at home could not meet its needs, its economic needs. So it had to continue to go abroad into places like Fashoda, into to, to places like the Transvaal in South Africa. Okay. Globalization, right? You have to expand or die. You can't sustain the economic needs of your society at home alone. So uh, uh, on the eve of World War I, then, you can kind of see this growing this growing sense of conflict of need. And this is what Lenin's talking about. He's saying that capitalism's highest stage is going to be imperialism, that capitalism will inevitably lead to imperialism because capitalism cannot sustain economic growth at home alone. It's going to have to find new areas and new territories. But once the Fashodas of the world and the Transvaals of the world and the Kiachows of the world and the, and the Hong Kongs of the world are all swallowed up, they're going to go after each other. They're going to go after each other. And in fact, this is what the Germans and the British and the French and the Russians were doing. They're, they're looking for new areas. They're building new navies while the U.S. is pursuing the open door. All right? They understand then that, 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 that uh, imperialism, the way it's been practiced traditionally, is going to lead to conflict. All right? Now, Lenin is a harsh critic of this. He is, you know, kind of against empire. Lenin is the best known critic of imperialism. He basically lays out the analysis I just told you. This is the high stage of capitalism. Capitalism is going to lead to conflict. What's Lenin's solution to all this? Communism, worldwide communist revolution. Okay? There's another critic of imperialism. I was going to do it here, but I'm going to talk about it later. In fact, it's going to be Woodrow Wilson. Wilson, too, will be a harsh critic of imperialism. But what's Wilson's analysis based on? It's not on communism. It's based on what kind of trade, especially? Oh. Open door. Open door. So both Wilson and Lenin actually are attacking this imperial system, okay? Because this imperial system is old school. It's European, it's based on balance of power, it's based on this architecture in which major powers go in and swallow up smaller powers. But they are inevitably, inevitably going to clash with each other. Both Lenin and Wilson see it the same way. The solution is going to be quite different. Lenin's going to say worldwide, socialist, communist, upheaval. Wilson's going to say the open door. And we'll go 
more into that. The coming of war, I want to go through this really quickly because it's kind of an old, it's, it's so complicated, you either have to do like a whole class on it or fly through it, and I'll, I'll go through it very quickly. The, the coming of war, how this thing gets started, because this is important. First off, in the early 1900s, the major powers basically know something's going to blow. You can see, I mean, Fashoda and the Boer War indicate that something's got to give. In addition to that, there's this frenzy of capitals coming into Europe and all these countries are trying to establish economic relationships with one another. British is a huge creditor. Britain's the biggest creditor in the world. They're loaning money out, which is great. I mean, you'd rather be a creditor than a debtor, to be sure. So Europe is really in this frenzy. And Lenin anticipates that this is all going to erupt at some point, and so does Wilson. They both see it pretty similarly. And it does. And they start making, well, before that, they start making alliances, in fact. The British and the French create something called the Entente Cordiale. The, you know, an, a, a cord, cord, an Entente is, is kind of like an alliance. It is an alliance. So the British and French agree. Uh, they, had almost go, they had almost gone to war over Fashoda. Now they're on the same side against who do you think? Germany, because they anticipate Germany's involved in this naval buildup. Germany is the country everybody's afraid of, major industrial output. In addition to that, France has a long-standing alliance with Russia, which it had done after 1871, because what had Germany done in 1871? Franco-Prussian War and invaded France, right? So the French and the Russians are allied against the Germans, and now the British and the French are allied against the Germans. Right? So you can kind of see where this is headed. Britain, France, and Russia are all already pretty much on the same side. During the war, when the war comes, this is going to be called the Triple Entente. So they're already lined up against the Germans. The Germans have an ally in, if we go to the map, in, uh, basically their only ally in Europe is, is the Habsburgs, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Habsburg Empire is in trouble. It's in decay. It's kind of like the Manchus in China, falling apart, internal division. A lot of the, so the states are seeking sovereignty. So the Germans' only ally in, in a, a, a Europe is going to be the Habsburg Empire. Now, the rest of Europe is saying the Habsburgs are going to fall apart. And as soon as they fall apart, what's going to happen? We're going to all dash in and get our peace. Get a piece of the pie, right? So this is kind of the way they're thinking. In the same way, the Ottomans are wiped out in 1912. And the Ottoman Empire basically falls apart as the Bulgarians and Serbs. This is going to get really complicated. Don't worry about it. All right, I'm going to say you know, all the Balkans. Really, it's just like it is today, right? The Ottomans are basically wiped out in 1912. So what happens? Everybody dashes in. They want their piece of the Ottomans, right? The, the old Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Turkey, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, all of them are claiming territory in this region. This is called the Balkans. Okay, this is the Balkans kind of powder keg. There's another map here. I don't know if this one will be any better than that. Uh, it's too big. Not going to work. Anyway, let me see if I can just get that, that quadrant there. I might be able to do that. I'm sure there's some way of shrinking this, but I don't know it. Yeah, actually, this will work. All right. Um, if we could go to the... Oh, he's, he's two steps ahead of me. Okay, here's Turkey. This is the, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. This is the Balkans here. All right. And you can see everybody kind of dashing in. All right. Um, in 1913, the, the Ottomans were overthrown in 1912. In 1913, a second Balkans war began. And again, don't worry about the details. This is really complex. Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, I'm, I'm sorry, Greece, Serbia, Turkey, and Romania fought against Bulgaria. Bulgaria but was beaten. What comes out of this, which is somewhat important, is that Serbia is the big winner. However, Serbia is denied the fruits of its labor, so to speak. Serbia traditionally had an alliance with one major country in, in, in I just gave it away, in Europe, still today the Serbs and the Russians are allied, and they still are today, right? The only buddy backing Serbia's claim, because Serbia had fought and won in the Second Balkans War, were the Russians. The rest of the countries kind of ganged up on Serbia, all right? So one thing leads to another, and then in 1914, there's an archduke from uh, Austria, from Aust the Austro-Hungarian Empire named Franz Ferdinand and he's in a motorcade and a Serbian nationalist from a group called the Black Hand assassinates him. The Black Hand was called a terrorist group. Right? Now, 
this guy who assassinated Franz Ferdinand didn't have any connection to the Serbian government. However, the Germans and the Habsburgs decided to use this. And so they force Serbia to make all these apologies and pay reparations and so forth. And Serbia does all that. But it's still not enough. So the Germans are going to use this as a pretext to go to war. Germany is looking to shore up the Habsburg Empire. And in addition to that, this is kind of what Lenin had talked about. This is the, this is the inter-imperialist war. Germany wants to expand and take control over all of uh, go to either one. Which, okay, Germany's role is traditionally going to be as the kind of uber power in Central Europe. And it's accepted, this is a traditional role, it's not out of the ordinary, it's not all that unusual. It's the same thing when Hitler takes off, we talked about appeasement later on. I mean, when Hitler starts to do this, this is not out of the ordinary at, the, at first, you know, until you start to see this kind of worldwide global conquest and, and, and the final solution. But initially, uh, uh, what Germany conceives of is, is taking over all of, of, of Central Europe. And so it's preparing for war. It's pushing the Habsburgs for war. The Habsburgs reject any attempt by the Serbs to, uh, to apologize or to pay reparations. The French begin putting pressure on Russia to mobilize for war because Germany is pushing the Habsburgs to go to war. Germany and Russia both mobilize. Germany says to Russia, you have to stop your military preparations. And the Russians say, we're not going to stop ours until you stop yours first. Russia refuses and Germany declares war against Russia on August 1st, 1914. The most famous book, I think without a doubt, on the origins of World War I is by uh, Barbara Tuckman called The Guns of August, in which she says, well, they missed signals and they misunderstood each other and they could have stopped and communications was bad. You know, and that kind of, that's kind of part of the whole Franz Ferdinand assassination caused World War I school. I mean, this stuff was in the works for a long time. Right? These inter-imperial rivalries, this need for resources and trade and investment in areas outside of Europe was so great that by August of 1914, essentially this stuff had already been played out. All right? And you can talk about mixed signals and political assassinations all you want, but this wasn't a war over, you know, kind of hurt feelings or, or, or you know, political assassinations. This was about empire. This was about who would control the resources of Europe. And if you control the resources of Europe, you got a lot going for you. So on August 1st, 1914, Germany declared war on uh, 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 Russia. On August 3rd, Germany invaded Belgium, and as a result of treaty obligations, what did Britain and France do? They joined the war. So you basically have Britain and France and Russia against Germany and the Habsburgs in August of 1914. Uh, doesn't, you know, that doesn't do it justice, but you know, that's quick enough. Anybody have any questions on that? There's a ton of stuff if you want to read anything about it. I mean, there's all, I mean, you can read the Guns of August, you know, it's actually incredibly detailed and exhaustive that way. So what's the U.S. do? What's the U.S. do? This is kind of a time for Woodrow Wilson to kind of play out his overall theory. Like Lenin, Wilson had been a great uh, a critic of, uh, of empire, okay? <clears throat> now, Lenin believes in, in kind of global communism, right? All right, Wilson, um, Wilson looks at the world, and the Europeans have kind of closed off certain areas to it, right? You know, you have these areas which nobody's allowed in. Those, those are out. Wilson believes in the open door. So Wilson is a critic of imperialism because he wants access to all of these areas. He believes that the U.S. should be able to go in and trade anywhere. Now, what is Wilson's major strength? What is America's major strength? It's economics, right? It doesn't have the military capacity to go in and occupy vast tracts of land like the British or the Germans or the French have. But he has money. He has dollar diplomacy. We can send bankers in. We can create banking consortia. We can send J.P. Morgan in. We can send uh, uh, you know, Rockefellers and the Carnegie's or, and create all these economic opportunities for trade and for investment investment and everything else. So what he's saying is that the old style imperialism, same thing Lenin is saying, is wrong. Right? 
Lenin is saying, you know, how it's going to lead to these intercapitalist rivalries, which are going to lead to wars, and 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 Lenin also has kind of a, a kind of a, 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 a there's this kind of people-oriented aspect to, to Lenin's critique. The people in these areas are being oppressed. They're part of the global proletariat, right? They're the ones doing all the work. They're enslaved. They're working in the mines and the mills and the factories. They're not getting the fruits of their labor. And Wilson isn't talking about any of that. Wilson's saying all of these areas should be part of the open door, and sp especially Wilson is talking about this area here in the Balkans, all right? Because in the Balkans you have white European people, and these are industrialized areas here, all right? So, uh, uh, I mean, the third world is nice, but the third world is underdeveloped. I mean, you know, eventually places like Fashoda may have some use, but in 1906, what good is Fashoda? There's nothing there. But in, the, in these areas, in the Balkans, in, in uh, in uh, Central Europe, you have uh, uh, coal and iron and coke, and you can create factories and mills and for industrial output. So when Wilson talks about anti-imperialism, he's especially talking about this area here in Europe, right? Because this is where this kind of free market can take over, where this open door could create incredible riches. Wilson envisions this world based on this kind of interrelated, globalized market where the, the, the economic uh, health of Europe is directly connected to the economic success of the United States and vice versa. They need each other. Wilson sees the world in an incredibly integrative fashion. He's a very profound thinker. I mean, a lot of the stuff he thought was you know, really kind of distasteful. His views on race, for instance, were hideous. He, he actually premiered Birth of a Nation, uh, which is an incredibly racist movie at the White House and talked about how great it was. But his political economic view, his, his views were, were referred to by one historian as liberal capitalist internationalism. It's kind of a fancy word, but basically um, what Wilson believes in is uh, uh, an integrated world where free trade and free investment and free markets will take root, where you won't have colonialism, where countries won't be kept out of certain areas because they're part of the British Empire, the French Empire, the German Empire, whatever else, where everybody will have access to these markets. All right? This is his liberal, capital, internationalized world. It's a global open door. This is globalization. No tariffs, low taxes, no subsidies, free trade, free seas, free goods. The easier it is to trade, the more prosperous and peaceful all of us will be. This is Wilson's vision. All right? Now that's not Lenin's solution at all. Lenin's is calling for a global socialist uprising led by the workers and the farmers and the peasants and the homeless and the landless. It's totally different in that regard. But their analysis of imperialism is pretty much, right, pretty much th the same. So as World War I begins, Wilson sees this as an opportunity to create a new world, right? I mean, the Europeans are fighting kind of old school to try to continue to have control over particular areas. It's balance of power, it's old diplomacy, it's old imperialism. But Wilson sees a chance to create a new world order. It's a phrase George Bush would use during the first Gulf War, 1990, 91, all the time. We're going to create a new world order. That's straight out of Wilson. Wilson wanted to create a new world order based on free trade, based on global capitalism, based on globalization. This is the liberal globalizing mission that dominated the U.S. throughout the 20th century. Republican and Democrat administrations like really up until Bush 43. This is when you finally see the departure and Bush essentially abandons it. But up to that time, from the days you know, really of TR and Taft and dollar diplomacy through Wilson onward. This is a century of globalization. And World War I, Wilson sees as an opportunity to create and carve out this new world order, an open world, without imperialism, without war, without revolution, where the barriers to trade and hence to democracy will be eliminated. Because after all, what is democracy? What have, we keep, what have we been saying here? What is democracy? What is civilization? It's c commercial freedom, right? So those barriers will be eliminated. And we will have uh, uh, an era of prosperity and hence peace. Okay? So this is Wilson's concept. Initially, when the war begins, and there's already a carnage in 1915, you already have you know, millions of being killed and millions and millions of casualties. Wilson issues a proclamation of neutrality. As soon as the war begins, Wilson says Americans have to be neutral. 
in all ways, all right? In reality, however, was Wilson neutral? No, not at all. Wilson's neutrality was, was a so-called neutrality. It was actually a pro-British neutrality. On one hand, Wilson always had good relations with the British. He had studied the British parliamentary system. His advisors were Anglophiles. They were pro-British. Germany was kind of culturally different. It was an upstart. Uh, Germany did not have the same kind of PR uh, that the United States did. So culturally, the Americans obviously identify with the British far more than the Germans. But even more importantly, that were America's commercial interests. As soon as the war breaks out, what do the uh, uh, British need? They need they need stuff, right? They need stuff. Okay, they need consumer goods and war uh, uh, materiel, and so. Uh, um, the United States sees a great opportunity there. And they begin to trade with the British. They don't begin to trade, they continue to trade with the British. So on one hand, Wilson's calling for neutrality, but, and that's why I have these numbers up here. If you look at the reality of it, these are American exports uh, to France and Britain and then to Germany, to the Allies, France and Britain and then to Germany. In 1914, which is the year the war breaks out in August, uh, U.S. trade with France and Britain is, is uh, 700 and... Uh, let me just try to highlight this whole thing here. I keep pointing my finger at it like a dummy, uh, thinking that... Uh, <coughs> all right. Does that show up in there? Yeah, it does. Cool. Um, in 1914, uh, a war breaks out in August. You can see there's about a 2 to 1 uh, uh, ratio, a little over 2 to 1 trade with, with Germany and the Allies. 1915, the first full year of the war, 1.28 billion Trade with Germany goes from 345 down to 29 million. That's less than a 10 percent, less than 10 percent, less than a tenth of what had it been the previous year. And then by 1916, trade with the Allies is up to 2.75 billion uh, uh, dollars, and um, with the Germans, it's down to two million bucks. So you go from 345 to two million in just a couple years. Whereas uh, uh, with the Allies, it goes from 754 to 275. All right. In this period, between 1914 and 1917, the J.P. Morgan Banking House served as the agent for the British and the French and arranged shipments of billions of dollars worth of goods to the Allies. I importantly, copper and steel and cotton and wheat and oil and munitions all went to the British and the French in huge numbers. And why are those goods important? That's how you fight a war, right? And copper, steel, munitions, and so forth. So the United States clearly then is, is deeply involved in the, um, the, uh, 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 in the war already from the start. They have a vested interest now in Britain's success, don't they? Okay, they are accruing huge debts. When the war begins, the U.S. is an international debtor and Britain is an international creditor. All right. Now what's happening is you can see this is reversing. Now Britain is acquiring huge debts and the U.S. is acquiring huge credits. You're better off being a creditor than a debtor. So what do the British and French have to do? They find themselves falling into debt to the United States. They begin selling off. The, the, the securities they hold in the United States, bonds and things like that. They begin to liquidate investments worth several billions of dollars. And then they have to seek loans. And where do they go for loans? They go to the United States. They go to Wall Street. Now, the Secretary of State at this time is William Jennings Bryan. Bryan believed in real neutrality and he opposed all of these loans. He urged Wilson to be really neutral, to not support the uh, the British because that would uh, uh, you know basically uh, prolong the war that would you know exacerbate the situation in Europe however Wilson had his conception of the world Wilson believed that America could use its economic strength to force open the British Empire to defeat Germany's attempt to gain control over Central Europe and then hence make that part of the open door as well. Wilson sees this as an opportunity to kind of upend the old imperial system in Europe and create an open door Europe. In addition to that to give 
uh, sovereignty to these countries in the Balkans to create new markets and areas there as well. So this is Wilson's view. In addition to that, without these loans and without this trade, how would that affect the American economy? I mean, it would suffer as well, right, if the U.S. lost all this business. So this is Wilson's vision of creating a new world. And, and British success is integral to that. It's a way to force open these old imperial systems. Yeah? I'm not getting anything. But in reality, where could they really go? If they couldn't get it from the United States, where would they go for the money? The British and the... It would have been difficult. Oh, yeah, no doubt. But, I mean, the point here isn't necessarily that they came to the U.S. It's that the U.S. didn't do it for Germany. I mean, you know, look... Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly they, they see themselves, in, from the start, they see themselves as part of the same process. If they want to maintain this world that works to their benefit, then they have to work together. Germany is a greater threat, right? So, yeah, they didn't really have a whole lot of options. I mean, clearly the U.S. would be the most likely place to go. They had to. But at the same time, you know, the fact is the U.S. didn't do this for Germany. The U.S. wanted to make sure that Germany didn't uh, gain control over, over that. Um, in the course of, of the war, the U.S. permitted loans to the Allies of over $2 billion, whereas uh, to Germany, only $27 million. So $27 million versus well over $2 billion. So again, that's what, 100 to 1 or 1,000 to 1 ratio, you do the math. Right? So there's a huge gap, a vast gap, in the amount of financial assistance that the U.S. gave uh, to the um, to the Allies, just as the amount of trade, the trade gap was great. And Germany was, of course, alarmed by all this. So uh, 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 financially then, uh, there was no neutrality. On another issue, just as important, was uh, international law, especially submarine warfare. Uh, as soon as the uh, war began, uh, Britain declared a blockade around um, around Germany. Let me see if I... Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Is that up there? Okay, this is the North Sea. Germany blockades this. They mine the North Sea. Okay, why do they do that? To keep anybody from supplying Germany, right? This leads, in the winter of 1914-1915, to a so-called starvation blockade. Germany suffers through what it calls the turnip winter. People literally are starving, they're eating turnips and things like that. Now, according to international law, you are allowed to keep out contraband. What's contraband? Illegal stuff that is used for fighting a war, all right? So you're supposed to keep out contraband. This blockade should have kept out guns, and you can, you can, you can define it pretty broadly. Oil could be used for war, right? But what the, what the British put on the contraband list included things like wheat and cotton and medicine, all right? So <clears throat> the Germans are complaining, look, they're killing us off. They, they won't allow food in, they won't allow medicine in. This violates international law, all right? And William Jennings Bryan is telling Wilson, this isn't right. You know, this isn't right. You have to abide by international law and you do it fairly and balanced. And Wilson isn't doing anything. Wilson is allowing the British to maintain this starvation blockade. So Germany responds then with uh, submarine warfare, U-boat, underwater boat warfare. U-boats uh, had been kind of a new development. They had really, I think, Germany at the outset of the war had about 20, but by 1917 or 18 had well over 100. So it's a technology that's really you know, emerging in this period. Now, according to international law, this is kind of arcane and doesn't really mean a whole lot anymore in international law, but in World War I it had a great deal of meaning. In the Great War, they didn't call it World War I yet. It was called the Great War. In the Great War, international law had a lot of meaning. According to international law, if you are going to, all right, Navy ships can attack each other anytime you want. You see a Navy ship, you attack it, boom, no problem. Merchant ships, commercial ships, ships carrying goods, aren't allowed to be armed. All right, they shouldn't be armed. Uh, uh, if it's armed and you want to sink it, you have to warn them. You have to fire a shot across the bow, allow them all to get into lifeboats and get off, and then you blow up the ship. All right? Uh, so you have to, if you're going to attack a merchant ship, you have to warn the victim ship to ensure the, the safety of its passengers. Now, problem here is if you have a submarine, what does a sub have to do? 
it has to surface and as soon as it surfaces what happens you see it and you, you shoot it so Germany could not it claimed abide by international law it could not fire these warning shots uh, across the bow so when Jennings Bryant says okay let's 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 make a deal here we'll get Britain to end this food blockade and in turn we'll get Germany to stop using these submarines because what Germany was doing you know because it couldn't surface was just blowing these ships up without a warning right and so Wilson says, that's a violation of international law. You can't do that. He complains to Germany. And William Jennings Bryan says, well, if you're going to complain to Germany, you've got to complain to Britain, too, about the food blockade. Why don't we get both of them to stop? Get Britain and the food blockade. We'll get Germany to stop U-boat warfare, submarine warfare. And the Germans say, we'll think about it. We'll meet. Let's talk about it. But Britain refuses. So Wilson says, okay. So the situation continues as it was. Wilson accepted the British decision. Germany hence believed it had nothing, no alternative but to expand submarine warfare. In the months February, March, April, May of 1915 alone, Britain sunk over 90 Allied ships. Sorry, Germany sunk over 90 Allied ships. But in May of 1915, it sunk an American liner called the Lusitania, which you've probably all heard about. Uh, the Lusitania was leaving New York for Britain. The Germans had taken an ad out in the New York papers warning Americans against traveling on the Lusitania. Nonetheless, Wilson said they're Americans, they have the right to go wherever they want. The people in New York said, we're Americans, they can't do anything to us, you know. And Germany sunk the Lusitania, 1,200 people, including 128 Americans, died. There's a huge call for war in the United States. They sunk the Lusitania, we need to go to war. Wilson sent a note to Brazil, to Brazil, to Berlin, demanding that they disavow the sinking of the Lusitania and that they end warfare by U-boats. Germany agrees. It wants to keep the U.S. out of the war. So Germany says, okay, no more sub-warfare. William Jennings Bryan says, that's good. Now send a note also to the British because the British are violating our neutral rights. Britain is flying American flags on its ships. It's stopping American ships as they go into neutral harbors. For instance, the U.S. is trying to, uh, 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 the British stop American ships from going into Norway, Sweden, or Denmark. Okay, why would that be? The, US, the, the British are not allowing America to trade with neutral countries, Norway, Sweden, or Denmark. Yeah, the idea there is that that's, those goods would go cross land into Germany. So Britain is violating America's neutral rights, flying American flags, stopping neutral trade. So William Jennings Bryan says, that's great. You get Germany to end sub-warfare, you should, but you also need to get Britain to stop violating our neutral rights. And again, Wilson says, no. He says, we will hold Germany to strict accountability. Strict accountability, what's that mean? And right now, all right, strict accountability. But what will we hold Britain to? accountability after the war. Okay, so there's clearly a difference there. At that point, William Jennings Bryan's had enough and he resigns. He, he quits. The new Secretary of State is Robert Lansing, who looks at the world the same way. Um, uh, uh, Wilson does, and Wilson is moving more and more toward war. In early 1916, he sends his advisor and friend, uh, Colonel Edward House, to Britain to meet with uh, Sir Edmund Gray who is the Foreign Secretary, they signed something called the House Gray Memorandum, which says that if Germany resumes submarine warfare, after the Lusitania, Germany quits sub-warfare, but if Germany resumes sub-warfare, then the U.S. will enter the war on Britain's behalf. All right. At the same time, um, Wilson is running for re-election in 1916. And even though he supports the British, he doesn't want to involve, get involved in a war. That's always dicey. And in fact, Wilson's motto is he kept us out of the war. He's running as a peace candidate. I'm not going to send your kids to fight in Europe. This isn't your war. This is the same thing Roosevelt will do in 1940, LBJ will do in 1964. We're not going to send American boys to fight in a foreign war. So this is Wilson's line in 1916. So even though he has this secret deal with the British saying, we'll enter the war on your behalf, 
right? He's still trying to kind of play a coy and, and stay out. And he comes up with a plan. He and Lansing, the new Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, come up with a new plan. They say that the Allies will disarm their merchant vessels. Their commercial ships won't be armed anymore. And in return, Germany will surface and warn enemy ships before it attacks it. And again, Germany says, yes, we'll do that. And Britain says, no. And this time, Wilson rejects his own plan because Britain won't go along with it. Wilson reversed himself. The key entry, the key issue in U.S. entry into the war continues to be this question of submarine warfare. And part of it is about Americans traveling on these ships. These ships, not only the Lusitania, but the uh, Sussex, uh, uh, which is a, uh, another liner that was sunk, uh, I believe, off the coast of France, have Americans on board. And the idea there is that as Americans, we can travel anywhere we want. All right, even on armed ships. Okay, in fact, in Congress, a, a, a couple, a congressman and a senator, named, uh, the Gore, I can't remember, this, Al Gore's cousin or something, like Gore Vidal's great grandfather or something, Gore and Jeff McLemore from Oklahoma put a, together a resolution called the Gore McLemore Resolution, which would have prevented Americans from traveling on belligerent ships, saying, look, you know, you are at risk. You are not allowed to travel on British or French ships. Wilson killed it, basically saying Americans can travel wherever they want, whoever they want. We're Americans. We have a right to free seas. We have a right to free travel, to free, to free movement. And so Wilson continues to essentially sponsor the idea that Americans can travel on these belligerent ships. And like the Lusitania, the Sussex is, is attacked um, uh, in March of 1916, and a bunch of Americans uh, uh, are killed on that um, as well. So uh, throughout 1915 and 16, and, and after that, Br Germany again promises not to use uh, uh, submarines. They make the Sussex Pledge, which is just like the Lusitania Pledge. It says we're not going to use sub-warfare anymore. And it doesn't throughout the end of, throughout the rest of, of 1916. Um, However, the situation for Germany is becoming dire. Uh, all it really has is subs to maintain it on the seas. You notice I haven't talked about the war on the land in Europe. If you know anything about it, it was just a bloodbath. Have you seen any of the movies about World War I or read any of the great mo novels that all quiet on the Western Front, probably the best known? The war on the land in Europe was just a bloodbath. It was trench warfare, where literally you build these huge trenches and you bombard the other side, and then you all get up in unison and you march toward them and you're gunned down and then you retreat. And then later that side bombards and they all stand up and I mean massive numbers I mean hundreds of thousands of people are dying at places like Verdun or uh, along the Somme and no territory is being gained and, and, and the countryside is being devastated and hospitals and churches and schools are all being wiped out and it's really kind of in a sense one of the first modern wars the American Civil War was modern in the sense of the technology but it was also very much a, a, a you know people would actually go to the battlefield and and, and watch the war, you know, places, you know, they, Antietam and whatnot. They, women with their parasols and, you know, men would be out there, you know, selling food to watch the battle, you know, like Gettysburgers, things like that. Um, uh, but World War I really brings in the civilian population in ways that, that, that you've never seen before. So the war on, on the land is just this grinding, bloody war of attrition, and no one's really gaining anything from it. The war on the, and this is the war in the West. I'm not talking about the war in the East with the Russians either. I'll mention that a little bit later. But, but it's the war on the seas that is far more kind of electric and you know, fluid, to use a bad pun. And, and the Germans really have... Uh, uh, no weapon that's useful other than the submarine. So in early 1917, they resume submarine warfare. Uh, and it's at this point that, that uh, Wilson breaks off diplomatic relations with the, um, with the, um, the Germans and ultimately in April goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war. Why did Wilson declare war? Because there it is, because, oops, excuse me, because, <laughs> there we go, the world must be made safer, don't I, right? It's kind of anticlimactic. I have to get better at my props, all right? Wilson says, we're going to war because Americans have to be allowed to travel, <clears throat> and we can't allow these, you know, terrible Germans to take over Europe. And the British are our friends. We share a common cultural heritage of democracy, of free government. All right? So this is Wilson's public rationale. All right? 
what was the cause then of U.S. entry into the war? Well, it was, in a sense, it was about ships and it was about free seas. Um, a couple things, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of didn't mention that, and everybody does, and I probably should. In, in February of 1917, Germany sent a message uh, through its uh, foreign minister, Joachim Zimmerman, to the Mexicans, saying to the Mexicans, look, um, if you help us in this war, if you uh, uh, either fight with us or stir up trouble on the border, uh, then we will help you get lands that the Americans took from you back, all right? And it's intercepted and made public, and this is a big brouhaha. Oh, the Germans are trying to come into our, you know, and, and, and playing the German card at work. We talked about that before in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Venezuela. Uh, Germany had been involved in, in, in the Americas. It had invested and had sent bankers in. So, it, you know, kind of like in the 19th century, you, you say, well, if we don't do this, the British are going to take over. You can always, you know, score political points by saying, oh, the Germans are going to come in. And essentially, that's the fear. Oh, the Ger look, the Germans are trying to get Mexico to, in real terms, it really didn't mean much really mean anything you know I mean it's kind of like the, the assassination of the Archduke it's one of those kind of pop history things that everybody learns you know for Jeopardy or you know Trivial Pursuits or something like that but in the big picture it doesn't really mean a whole lot yeah I think it, I think that had a, a lot to do with it I th you mean the, the kind of just the general nature of economic relations well actually If if Britain lo if Britain loses if Britain loses what happens to to your to your loans to your investment, it's it's gone right and in fact I mean that's actually a segue, um, the way that all right we're going to do a little bit of economics here so brace yourselves okay, um, at the time the world was organized according to kind of what was called classical or liberal economics much like if you know anything about economics monetarist theory in the 70s and 80s all right. Basically, uh, the idea there was that prices varied according to the quantity of money. Therefore, the quantity of money determined the price level. So, uh, uh, the price of things was determined by how much money was in circulation. And what was used to determine the value of money? What kind of standard? Gold. Right? So, if you accru accrued debts, how did you pay those debts off? In gold. All right. So if the British traded with the Americans or got loans from the Americans, how would it pay those? Gold. So you send goods from New York to, to London, all right? You send goods, cotton, munitions, steel, whatever. And how do you pay for that? You send gold from London to New York. The only problem is what's happening? as that gold is being transshipped from London to New York. It's encountering German subs, and what are the Germans doing? They're sinking a lot of ships, all right? So on one hand, Wilson sees the loss of America. I mean, these, these, are, these debts are no good, right? I mean, they're, you know, and, and you get to the point, you know, you try to get Lloyds of London to insure these ships, but can you, you know, it's just, a, you can't do it during wartime, it's prohibitive. So on one hand then, Wilson sees American debts you know, going unpaid. And if the U.S. doesn't intervene, this is going to become a, a, an even greater problem. There's also kind of a monetarist explanation. This is really kind of, I'll try, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. And it has to do with one of my favorite economists, John Maynard Keynes. We'll talk a, more about Keynes later, if anybody's familiar with Keynesianism. Keynes was a British Treasury official, really well known. Keynes also was important in bringing America into the war. At the time, you have this classical liberal economic idea of the quantity of money, what I just mentioned, the quantity of money determines price levels. In it, the aim is long-term stability. You want to keep a stable supply of money in order to maintain price levels. If prices remain at a decent level, then wages and employment will continue to be stable as well. It will keep people at work. It will keep prices stable. You can get domestic. You can do that by keeping domestic currencies convertible to gold at a fixed rate. All right. The way to keep a stable long-term money supply is to have all currencies convertible to a stable commodity, which is gold, at fixed, not floating, rates. This is real simple stuff, okay? So you have to maintain stable levels of currency. If you have too much currency in, in circulation, what will happen? What's the result of too much currency? Inflation. 
Okay, too little, deflation. Okay, so Keynes was able to convince the British government to maintain convertibility. All right, as opposed to inflate going to inflationary practices. I mean, one way when you're in debt, how do you deal with it? You, you print money. You just run the printing press. So how did the North, or well, the Confederates even more, of course, but how did the North uh, fund the Civil War? They just they printed paper money, greenbacks, right? So one way when you're in debt to deal with it is to just run the printing press. You print more and more and more money. But what does that do? It inflates the currency. It's not worth as much, right? So the British could have done that when they were in debt. But instead, Keynes and others convinced them to maintain convertibility, all right? If you maintain convertibility, then gold remains valuable. And who has more gold than anybody else in 1917? The United States. The U.S. actually had more gold because the British have been dumping it, right, to pay for the war for three years. So the U.S. has more gold. So if you want your debts repaid and Britain maintains this convertibility, then you need gold, right? You trade in your gold and you get dollars or pounds or whatever currency you want for it. So this is really critical. This idea of gold is really critical in America's decision to enter the war. On one hand, because, because these debts are being paid off with gold, which is on ships which are being sunk, right? And gold is ending up at the bottom of the Atlantic. And on another hand, because if Britain maintains this convertibility, if it continues to use gold as the standard for a fixed rate currency against running the printing presses and, and, and inflating the currency, then American gold remains valuable. And it is in Wilson's overall interest, it's more than an interest, it's a need to see Britain succeed. Okay, both to maintain the convertibility of gold and to get your debts paid. That sounds really highfalutin and complicated, but it's, it's really not. Is anybody, everybody clear on that? It's, it's, it's not that, that bad. So this draws America into the war. Right. From the German point of view, the Americans had acquiesced in the starvation blockade. American money and loans and trade and weapons had gone to the British and the French in huge numbers. American loans had been vital in supporting the British. Uh, the Americans had allowed uh, international law to be interpreted in a way that would certainly allow Britain to get away with the stuff it was doing. It allowed American passengers to continue to sail on warships. And so by April of 1917, um, Germany believed that American intervention was more or less inevitable and so Wilson goes to Congress and says yeah we're gonna we're gonna enter the war uh, to make the world safe for democracy and in a sense he wasn't lying because what was Wilson's vision of democracy free trade the open door free markets right anti imperial he was an anti-imperialist and a legitimate one so um, this is ultimately what draws the US into the war this is part of Wilson's globalization vision this is his new world order. You know, currency convertibility, free trade, not allowing the Germans to, because the real fear in both World War I and World War II with Germany is not just that Germany will gain control of Central Europe, but what will it do with all those resources? Yeah, but, but, but even more than that, what will it not, or maybe better, what will it not do with those resources? allow anyone else in. So the real, real, real fear, I mean, you know, Britain has its empire and it has a sterling block, but it's also becoming increasingly dependent on American capital. In fact, the U.S. becomes a creditor. Germany, however, if it succeeds, will close off Central Europe. And Central Europe is vital, coal and steel and manufacturing and trade. U.S. economy is contingent upon the European economy. They need each other. They have a, a, a real symbiotic relationship. If the German economy, if the European economy, you know, is closed off, if the United States doesn't have access to those materials, those resources, that trade, that capital, that investment, then the American economy will suffer accordingly, right? And Wilson has this integrated, it's a very, very, he's a profound thinker that way. It's an integrated view of the world. It's globalization. It's exactly what, you know, Clinton, especially in the past decade, was talking about with institutions like the World Trade Organization or World War II when we talk about the IMF. This is the exact thing they're trying to do, to create an integrated world where 
where you can't have economic success by closing off parts of the world, but in fact you have to open, open them up. And this is what Wilson sees in 1917. And it's vital for the U.S. to intervene uh, uh, to make sure that Britain succeeds, to make sure that Germany's dream of closing off Europe is not fulfilled. It's the same thing the Nazis are trying to do. It's the same thing Hitler's trying to do in World War II, to, to take all these ethnically German areas and close them off and not allow anybody. National socialism, look at the term. You think about it. National socialism. Right. National meaning closed socialism. Right? A phrase that you hear all the time, uh, not so much anymore, <clears throat> but traditionally to describe these kinds of uh, economies is autarky. Has anybody ever heard this? It's sometimes spelled with a K. You ever hear, what, what's autarky? Yeah. It's a closed, self-sufficient economy. What do you think Wilson thinks of autarky? It's very bad. It's, it, it's going to lead to war because you're going to need these resources and how are you going to get them, right? All right. So, I mean, this is, what, and this is kind of what, you know, uh, uh, Lenin anticipates too. This is where their analysis is very similar. They are against these closed systems, these autarkic systems, all right? These kind of state-run economies. National socialism is autarky. What Mussolini does is essentially autarky. Parts of what FDR will do in the New Deal are going to be, you know, are actually labeled autarkic as well. So, you know, the opposition to autarky is kind of open, private capitalism. And the real fear is that Germany, if it succeeds, will create an autarkic closed system, a self-reliant system. But if you're going to have a self-reliant system, you're going to have to have control and access to and control of resources and the, the other things you need. And you do this coercively, right? Wilson understands that too, but you don't do it coercively, you do it via the open door, except in like Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua, places like that. Anyway, so then this is how the U.S. gets involved in the war. This is part of Wilson's vision of a new global empire, a new world order. Any questions? The war itself, the U.S. gets involved late. It prepares for the war. More people actually die of an aerial disease than fighting. Uh, goes in in 1918. Has a really important role to play in some of the later battles. And an armistice is declared on November 11th, 1918. History of World War I in 22 seconds, which is... Well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Versailles, but the war itself, I just fly through. Um, so that's preparation and participation. Has an important role to play, but in the long term, I think... Um, uh, 50,000 Americans, I believe, died in the war. More Americans, I, I wasn't making that, more Americans actually died from like venereal disease and flu than from, uh, than from fighting. So the U.S. had a limited but an important role to play in the war. Um, there's another important, I think, issue, though, that we, we could talk about here very briefly. Uh, Wilson said he was going to war what to make the world safe for what? For democracy. What, what does that mean? In the United States... Um, uh, Wilson has a much different uh, conception of that than, uh, uh, than he did abroad. Um, as soon as the war begins, Wilson sets up something called the CPI, the Committee on Public Information. And this is kind of where that intersection, well, it's not even an intersection because I don't think they're really different spheres, but I talked the first class about how uh, domestic and foreign policy intersected, interacted, they were really seamless. I mean, in order to have an expansionist or an aggressive foreign policy, you need uh, to have uh, uh, an unquestioning or at least a very uncritical domestic population. These have to interact, right? If you're going to have this ab aggressive or expansive or imperialist, whatever you want to call it, imperialist foreign policy, you don't want a lot of people in the home country calling you out on it, right? You want to maintain a level of consensus. And how do you do that? Well, often coercively. And this is a, a, a really great example. There are several really good examples. Remember last week I mentioned the, the Alien and Sedition Acts during the, the French quasi-war in the 1790s. Uh, Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus during the Civil War to prevent people from, you know, kind of pro-Confederates from... from going free. Um, this is a good example of this. Wilson in World War I and the aftermath of World War I, the Red Scare, it's like McCarthyism or today, you know, with the Patriot Act. Wilson creates something called the CPI, the Committee on Public Information. The Committee on Public Information is a government propaganda 
institution. That's the only way to describe it. They put out films which they will show to schools and churches. Films which talk about how bad the Germans are, you know, the Kaiser, the Beast of Berlin, the Prussian Kerr. They put out stories that they feed to the media how the Germans are throwing babies in the air and then stabbing them with bayonets. A German soldier may have done that, a British soldier may have done that, but the stories they made up weren't true. They, they were lies. They made it up. Okay? In 1990, after Iraq had invaded Kuwait, they had this 15-year-old girl go to Congress and testify that the Iraqis were going into the Kuwaiti hospitals and unplugging incubators and killing Kuwaiti babies. It did, you know, Saddam Hussein's terrible. He's a horrible man. We all know that. He's capable of really horrible things. We all know that. But that never happened. The girl was actually the, the, uh, the, uh, the daughter of, I think, like a, a Kuwaiti ambassador or something. They made the whole thing up. All right. So you do this. The government does this as a way of getting the public to support. How can you question the war if the Germans are bayoneting babies? You know, are you are you pro bayoneting babies? You, you know, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you bad mouth people who are against bayoneting babies. You know, so it's it's this is what the CPI does, and it becomes kind of absurd. They rename sauerkraut Liberty so Liberty cabbage. They rename uh, bratwurst Liberty sausage. Um, Schools stop teaching the German language and symphonies stop playing, you know, Bach and, and, and Beethoven. They, they start deporting, you know, German nationals. Uh, mobs would attack people who were German. Uh, um, in 1918 in Missouri, a, a mob attacked a guy named Robert Prager, who was actually a, a nationalized American citizen. He was born in Germany, had an accent, but he was actually an American citizen. They attacked him and, and lynched him. Uh, because he was spoke with a German accent, and, and the, the, the jury acquitted him, and, and the, the jury foreman said, well, nobody can accuse us of not being loyal. So, you know, being loyal meant that you were able to, to lynch, you know, people who spoke with a German accent. And Wilson encouraged this. Wilson said, woe be to the man or the group of men who stands in our way. Can you imagine that? That's like saying you're either with us or you're against the terrorists. And nobody would say that because no one would look at the world in such simple ways. You know, there's no middle ground. Woe be to the man or group of men who stands in our way. Wilson gets Congress to pass something called the Espionage Act. Espionage Act says that it's illegal to even question government action, to even question the war. Eugene Debs, famous socialist orator, was in prison for 22 months for making a speech in Canton, Ohio. Actually, more than 22 months, like three or four years. He makes a speech in Canton, Ohio, where, where Debs says that this is a war for rich men and the children of the working class should not fight in this war. This is a capitalist war. Debs is in prison for three years for that by encouraging Americans to resist the war because it's a class war. It's an imperialist war. And he's thrown in jail for that, right? If you want to get out of your midterm, you can call Ashcroft on me, you know, for, for, for something like that. All right? So, so the Espionage Act basically says it's a crime to, 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 to oppose the war, to publicly oppose the war. I mean, it sounds silly, but there are really thousands of examples of this. Even more than that, because everyone else says, oh, the examples weren't that great. There were only so many. This is a country of millions of people and a few thousand. And it's no big deal. But what's really vital, I think, in all this, that you have to keep in mind, it's like McCarthyism or the Patriots. What people don't do, what people are afraid to do, what people are afraid to say, they're afraid to speak out. They're afraid to, to send letters to their congressmen. They're afraid to sign petitions. They're afraid to, to be interviewed or to even tell their neighbors what they really think. All right? So this is really critical and Wilson encourages this. Woe be to the man or to the group of men who stand in our way. All right? And this will lead to, to this kind of hyper-patriotism, racial antagonism, the level of crimes against African Americans, of lynchings increases tremendously. There's actually a racial riot here in Houston as a result of, of uh, racial practices in the Army in World War I. So all of this is part of the kind of domestic fallout of the war in Wilson. And we'll talk more about that next time.